So what we're going to talk about is facility configuration. So really, so what we're going to do today is talk about the facility module in general, like why we have it, what it does, how it differentiates from other setups. And then we're going to talk about, in general, how people use it uh, and what types of setups. So we're going to talk about categories, how they're used. Uh, we're going to talk about configuration of, you know, go through the configuration settings. And then we're going to talk about price group schedules. So first up here, you know, what, why the facility module? So the facility module, we added this into Double Knot really for what we, what we call reservations. So we obviously have these all these different event types starting with calendar activities really what facilities is for is for reservation items so that can be really the first thing we did it for was boy scout and girl scout off-season camp rentals so these boy scout councils and girl scout councils own properties and they run events at those properties but half the year they're not being used so they use those for off-season camp rentals so a Boy Scout Council has, as David knows, like Catalina Island Scout Camp, Camp Cherry Valley on Catalina Island, beautiful property, and they don't use it most of the year. So what they do is they create rentable assets like cabins and lean-tos and campsites that people can rent on those properties to make additional income. So that's really what the first way the facility module is used. So it's you can create rentable assets. It's also used for birthday party room reservation. Um, it can be used for tours, field trips. Uh, it's even used for like timed admission. It can be used for equipment rental. Really how it differentiates from calendar activities that it's, it's reservable and it's over a period of time. So you could create like if you look at timed admission, for example, you could create a calendar activity for every day of the week from 8 to 5 p.m. and create admission, but that's really not practical. It's easier to create one facility instead. So really the facility module is built for either reservable assets, reservable equipment, or a recurring reservable time slot for like tours or admission or things like that. So again, we're going to get into those specific setups uh, in the second version of this video. This video, we're going to more focus on how to do the initial configuration, and then we'll look at each type and how they differentiate next time. So really, the first thing you do before you actually go and build any type of facility is you have categories. So let me go to um, one of our orgs here, the San Jose Museum here, so you can see, for example. So a lot of the times we build separate sub organizations for facilities. And the reason you see that, and I'm sure all of you have seen this as you use the system, we build these sub orgs so that there's a separate search URL for each type of booking. So the San Jose Zoo may do field trips, birthday parties, equipment rental, whatever. And they want them on a separate booking calendar. And so in order to do that, we use sub organizations. So we'll have field trips, birthday parties as separate sub orgs so that the content is separated. So if someone goes to the San Jose Zoo website and they click on, I want to book a field trip, it goes to a booking calendar that only contains the field trip bookings. So we have this sub this sub org. It's really what we start with. And then we talk about, OK, so once we have these assets, how do we organize them? And that's where categories come in. So similar to event categories, really how they're used is to organize your types of assets. So if we were doing like a Boy Scout or Girl Scout camp, we could have categories of campsites, lean-tos, um, dining hall, shooting sports, cabins to kind of divide up the asset types. One critical aspect of categories with facilities is that they have everything in 
a given category has to have the same unit of booking, which we'll talk about in a moment. So you can't have assets that are hourly booking in the same category as a daytime booking asset. So the first thing we do really is build categories and we organize those assets in categories and we have public and private categories. So when you go and build a category, you have a category name, which will show up to the customer. So field trips, tours, you know, or it could be cabins, lean tos, whatever those are. And then you have this admin only checkbox. And so this would be used if you want to have hidden assets. And a lot of organizations do that. They want to have back end tools where they don't want the customer to reserve it. They want the customer to like fill out a form and like a survey and request a booking and then they go in and actually enter in the reservation themselves on the back end. And so a lot of times we'll have this checked and they're hidden assets within that category that the client can use for back office booking. The other way we use admin only is for blackouts and we'll get into that. Um, in our second meeting when we can actually apply it. Blackouts are something where people control, how people control availability. And so we'll talk about that when we look at real life actual assets and setups. So next thing after we define categories is really to <clears throat> actually build assets. And so once you have categories defined, you can come under facilities and say new facility. Now, what I'm going to do here is give you a general rundown of this configuration. Now, keep in mind the the tough thing about facilities is that a lot of this functionality is no longer used. But since it's an admin only back office tool that we configure, so when Charles and I implement new customers, we build these assets for them. So we're never training our customers on all of these settings. And part of the problem with that over time is there is configuration items in here that no longer function and really should be cleaned up. So as I go through this, I'm gonna point those out, but just keep in mind, hopefully in the future those are removed. So keep in mind that we're gonna focus on really what matters and how we use them. And again, we're gonna refer back to this training and this configuration in our next meeting when we actually go through and look at real life setups. So the description here is the name of the asset. And so this can be this can be a few things. This could be something like field trip, you know, 1030 to 1130 AM, something like that. The facility date here really start and end date. But so this could be so let me go back here. This could be something like field trip. It, we also sometimes put the time in the title because of how these assets display on the calendar. So if I just had one field trip per day, I could just say field trip and set the time. If I had multiple time slots, sometimes it's important to actually put those time slots here. Like for example, if I had field trip and the available time, you know, we do field trips, I'm going to say from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. and you can book them by the hour. I don't have to put a time here, but if I was building time slots for field trips, like I don't allow them to choose any hour between 9 and 3 p.m. I have specific time slots. Well, then you can put those time slots here as well. And again, once we look at specific setups, some of this will make more sense. I just want to give you an overview of what these settings are, and then we'll look at real life application. So I want to say facility available date. We usually set a big, vast date setting here because this is the life of this asset. And really why they're using facilities is because it's a reservable asset and they don't want to touch it. They want to build this field trip they can control availability, but they're not coming into this page and changing configuration. So normally what Charles and I will do is set a very large date gap here um, so that the customer doesn't ever really have to touch this. <clears throat> you have available time. So as I said, this is field trip 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. 
one click to register. What this does is this adds the asset right into the shopping cart. The reason it does that <laughs> is if say you had something like equipment rental where you didn't need to collect you know the number of you don't need to collect um, the number of people or you don't have form data if someone clicks to reserve the set of skis or they need to reserve a um, a a, sh a cart or a child seat or something like that you can say one click to register and once they select it it goes right into the car where they can continue on and make payment Number of assets of this type, this, this allows you to define multiple assets. So say we go back to like equipment and you have, we have, you know, size, um, size 10 ski boot. You can say, well, we have 20 size 10 ski boots. So you can say there are 20 assets of this type. You also can say we have 10 cabins that are the exact same. All the configuration is the same. We have 10 assets that are the exact same. They're available 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. You book them by the hour. We don't have, you know, we don't, they're all the same. You can say there are 10 assets of this type and it will create 10 unique assets based on this configuration. So you see this for equipment a lot. You see it for cabin, you see it for uh, camp, really off season camp rentals the most. Most of the time this is set to one because it's we're building unique um, assets. Asset capacity. So that is how much space are is available for this field trip. So I can say there's room for 50 total people in this field trip. This is a very important setting. So what this allow multiple reservations means, it says there's a capacity of 50, but multiple groups can book this up until this, up until this capacity. So someone could book a field trip from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. and take 25 spots. What this does is that it opens up the, the rest of that space for another group to book in that time slot. So this is a very crucial setting. So if it's unchecked, then it means if I if I'm a teacher and I come on and book this field trip from 9 to 10 a.m. If I have 15 or 20 or whatever, once I make my booking, that asset time is no longer available. If I check this, then that remaining space is available for another uh, group to book in the same time slot. Unit of booking. So this is, you know, a very important setting, like a lot of things on here, but this determines the unit of booking. It determines the category and it determines really the search page. So if I set this to 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. and I set this to hourly booking, that means that they can book on the hour from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. They can say, I want to book from 9 to 10, 9 to 2, 9 to 3, whatever it is. And the unit of booking is that that unit. You can have it say 15 minutes. They can book by the 30, by the 45. They can book by 90 minutes. They can book by the day. So I can say we have field trip and maybe you're doing something like this field trip 1030 to 1130. Well, you could set that asset something like this 1030 to 1130. And you could set that to day booking. And what that means is that there's no selection of hour or time or anything like that. So they can say 1-1-2022, 1, 1, 10 30 to 11 30 day booking. So they're just reserving this asset. They're not selecting a specific time within this time slot. They're just booking the field trip 10 30 to 11 30. Unit of booking really allows for usually it's either day or by the hour, stuff like that. Overnight is for really for off season camp rentals. So you can have something. This would be like check in, check out time. And again, we'll I'll show you these examples when we meet next time. But these really would be like check in, check out time. If you have overnight, that's what available time is, is your check in, check out. We have a unit of display. So when they go on and book, 
it says one day. If you wanted to change that to like one trip instead of day, field trip, something like that, you can do that. Cost ceiling. Cost ceiling allows you to set a price ceiling. So what I mean by that is you have a cost for an asset and the cost can be booked by the per person or it can be booked per unit of booking. And so what cost ceiling does is it says no matter how many units, so I could say two and I could say hour here. So if my unit of booking is one hour, they can book one hour, they can book four hours, but the max price is two hours. I'm not gonna charge them more than two hours worth. So they can book one hour, two hours, three, four, five, and the max cost is two hours. So I'm gonna max out because your price is multiplied by your unit of booking. So if you have a field trip that's hourly, you know, if I said it's available from, you know, eight, a.m. until 4 p.m., then they can book by the hour, but the cost ceiling is two hours. So no matter what, it's not going to charge them for more than two hours worth of reserve, reserve time. Minimum and maximum period booking one. So what this says is that the minimum, what's the minimum number of hours that they, they have to book? So I could say the minimum is two and the maximum is four. So what that's saying is it's all based on your unit of booking. So the system is saying they have to book a minimum of two hours and a maximum of four hours and the cost ceiling is two hours. So no matter if they book two, three or four hours, it's all the same price. That's basically what I'm telling the system to do. Now this here, is you can ignore this. This is booking period two. What this was designed for, all of these settings, was for when you have um, different prices within different days of the week. We have a different way to set that up, which I'll show you tomorrow. So you're not concerned with booking period two and start and end of those periods. You can ignore that. Advanced booking period. What this says is how far in advance can they reserve? So I'm going to set this to like, say I set this to seven days. That means that they have, that's, they can't book within seven days. That's really important for a lot of organizations because they don't want people coming in and reserving something for the next day. So you can set a, a certain number of days into the future where they have to book. It can't be within seven days. It's got to be outside. You also can restrict this to groups in the system. So Alexander was asking about groups the other day, and this is, I think, honestly, one organization in Double Knot uses this configuration. I think it's a Girl Scout Council. And so they used e-list and groups in the system. We know e-list and groups, right? And what they do is they create a private group called uh, Girl Scout Troops. And then they have a group called Outside Council Girl Scout Groups, and they add people to the correct group. And what this allows you to do is set different advanced booking periods for types of groups. So what they do is if it's a, you know, I'm the Los Angeles Area Council Girl Scouts, and I create a group for the troops that are in my council, and they can book three days in advance, but I create a group for outside councils and they have to wait up to seven days. So you can kind of give preferential treatment on when people can register for certain types of groups. Again, I think literally one client uses that function, but it's something like Charles, you would have to, would have to keep in mind in a configuration sense, because if a client said to us, Listen, we have we have these different groups that we have and they get certain treatment. They need to be able to book within, you know, three days, but then the general public, they get to book, you know, seven days out. I mean, it technically could come up um, and that functionality is here. Again, I think we have maybe one um, organization using it right now. <clears throat> so next thing we have here is booking interval 
So you can set time between bookings. So we can book by the hour, but I could tell the system book, book put a put a interval of 15, 30 or 45 minutes in between those bookings. So if someone booked, you know, two hours, eight to 10, don't let the next one start for that certain setting. Not used that often, but it allows people like think of like cleanup time. So if someone reserves the dining hall but we need a 30 minute interval between bookings. Um, we need a booking interval and a minimum, to, sorry, I, I, I bungled this part of it. You select the interval, then you say the minimum time between. So you basically say, we need 15 minutes between bookings, or we need 30 minutes between bookings, or we need one hour to 30 minutes between bookings. So this allows you to set that, um, set that for your assets. You also can just say same number of units, so you can say one hour um, and set that here. On this setting, it basically says, do you want to ask for the number of people on the booking page? So what that says is that when they come and search for an asset, do you want to ask for the number of people that they have? So this is really used for really hard capacity based facilities. We don't see it too often, but say you had a setup where there was a hard capacity of 50 for this type of field trip. And then for the other field trip, there was room for 100 and you wanted the teacher to come to the search page and enter the number of students and then show availability based on that answer. You could say ask for the number of registrants on that page. You'll see next time we meet, we try to simplify facilities um, because you, you there's a lot of options you have when building facilities, but you can overcomplicate it easily. So I usually when I build facilities, which again, you'll get a visual on, I try to simplify it because I want them to go to a calendar and do the minimal number of clicking. So the more you set you know, options here with min and max and asking for a number of registers, more things they have to click to view the availability of an asset. And again, I will give you a demonstration of that uh, on Thursday or next time we, we meet. We have, you know, general stuff here. This stuff is the same as calendar activity. This, this detail shows up on the search page. So you can hover over an asset and this details will pop up. Again, address, pretty standard stuff. Category, super important on facilities, so you can set your category. Registration begin date time. Again, this we always set this to really something wide open. So I have my facility dates of 1-1-2022 and 1-1-2026. So I really set these to way out in the future. So you don't want people to have to touch this. So these dates are usually way set out. Cost is per, again, you, you all know what this is, but really in facilities, we almost always see unnamed registrant. There's maybe two or three setups that have named registrant. The reason is, is very rarely do you need the names of every person attending for a facility, because it's not really an attendance event. It's something that's reserved. So you're reserving the conference room for your conference. We don't need to know the name of every person in the room. You're just reserving that space. So we have unnamed registrant, unnamed and per registration. We see this a lot, for example, unnamed and per registration, where they want to know for like a field trip, for example, they may want to know the number of students and the number of adults, right, the, for the field trip. And they can say students, are 15 and adults are no cost. And then there's a total reservation fee of $150. So these fees are multiplied by the unit of booking. So you'll see the unit of booking is one hour. There's a minimum of two hours and the cost ceiling is two. So it's not going to cost more than $300 total and $30 per student because it's 15 per hour per student and a registration cost of 150 an hour. Now, 
I could also do something like this, where I set the cost ceiling to, to one. And what that would do is that would just make this a flat fee. It's 15 per student, 150 to overall. And no matter if you book it one hour, two hours, whatever, it's just a flat $15 per student and $150. So you got to remember, all this stuff applies across the application, but these have different, because it's a reservable asset, these are multiplied by the unit of booking. And you can control that using cost ceiling and minimum maximum numbers of bookings, but you always have to remember that it multiplies it by the unit of booking. So if you reserve it for an hour, it's multiplied by each hour that you you're reserving it. Everything else down here is pretty straightforward. Again, that really comes along with facility reservation. We have things in here, you know, we have ticketing. We have, of course, your deposit payments into one thing we use a lot is collect group information. So group information, and we'll talk about this more in a moment, is a set of information that we collect about the um, about the group, and you can customize that per suborg. So for really what it does is it attaches a constituent record to a group. So this is used in Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts or for field trips where one person is kind of in charge of a large group of people. So we, what we do is they say, okay, fill out this group info. And what that information looks like is group registration attributes. So you can say group name, you could change this to school name, but it's, a, it's just a standardized set of information. You see, you can collect group type. What this does is it connects this to a constituent record. So say I'm a teacher or a Boy Scout leader or a Girl Scout leader, and I come on and sign up my school for a field trip. So I say, oh, this is Argonaut Elementary. Here's the main contact. I complete that booking. The next time I come on, I can log in and my group information is saved. It knows, oh, Dan, you were in here last year booking a field trip. Here's your group information. Do you want to use that same group or a new group? The organization also has that information saved. So when you go in and you say, if, if this had group information, so if I said new reservation, it's going to allow me to actually pre-select that information. So I can come in if they're collecting group information, it will like purchaser, it will allow me to search for an existing group in the system. So it will actually let me do that just like you search for a purchaser. So group information is pretty critical for, as I said, field trips, Boy Scout, Girl Scouts, where there's one person kind of in charge of that whole reservation and you want to connect that group to a person. And if you go to constituent management and under permissions and you go to program organizer permissions, you'll see here, here's where those groups are. So these are all the groups that have not e-list groups, but program groups in the system. So those are all under those groups and it really just is saved information attached to a profile. And that's saved that information like constituent info, it's saved so it can be used in the future. So initially there, I know that's a lot of configuration settings on facilities, but if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to the support team. Again, if you reach out to them, just provide them as much information as possible and please test, test, test. You cannot test enough. Um, make sure it's working for you. Um, thank you for attending and we hope you found this uh, useful.